Well, I'm excited to be in the house of the Lord today. There's just been an excitement in my spirit. And I say when we came in today, it, it, uh, we just sensed that uh, God's doing stuff. I like it when God does stuff. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, you know, uh, we've been studying the power of our words and uh, Proverbs 18, 21 tells us there's death and life in the power of the tongue, meaning that our words will produce genuine effects for our lives. Genuine effects. Genuine effects. The words we speak about or to people, about circumstances or situations, will either bring life or destruction. And we've learned that our words are seeds that carry the power to produce a harvest of like kind. Yes, like. like kind. We've learned that when we speak with faith, the words that God has spoken, we're releasing the power of His words and bring the fulfillment of His promises into manifestation in our life. Yes. We've also discussed the effects of words that we take in or listen to or hear. What words or whose words are we allowing to influence our life? Yeah. And we have found that when we are declaring our heartfelt praise to God, we're releasing His power into our battle and entering into the victory that He has ordained for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. We've been, that's just kind of a quick review of all of the places we've been so far with it. Now, I want to say this, as we are reading and studying and meditating on the Word of God, how are we handling the words that He is speaking into our heart? Uh -huh. Amen. I know, right? When that written word suddenly becomes a living word, a rhema word to us, how do we handle it? You know, a rhema word or living word is a specific word for a specific purpose for a specific time. Okay, if it's that important to God to speak it to us, what are we doing with it? It's an answer for a present question. Okay, it's a solution for a present problem. It's a healing for a present sickness. Wisdom to deal with a present situation. It's a now word from God that comes alive in His word for what we are facing right now. Yes. So we're responsible for the revelation that God has given us. Yes. Now if you look at the parable that Jesus told of the talents, okay, the talents were given out to the, the man's servants and uh, the one that had two, multi or two of them multiplied their talents. The one that had two multiplied it to four. The one who had five multiplied it to ten. The person who did nothing with his one, it was taken away from him and given to the one with ten. Yes. And they said, well, how can that be? Why would they do that? Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 29, For to everyone who has more will be given... And he will have abundance. But from him who does not have even what he has will be taken away. Now say, well, that doesn't sound fair. Life isn't fair. We have responsibility. Okay, now he was talking about uh, the talents, the, what was given them to do. But I want to talk about it as being revelation from God. Yes. When yes. God gives us revelation and we handle it properly with honor and with care and it into our lives by continuing to meditate on that revelation and look into the Word to see what is He speaking to us, we get more revelation. Yeah. It's multiplied to us. Yeah. Multiplied. To whom who has, more will be given. If you're serious about digging in to find out the meaning of the revelation, you'll get it. Yeah. And more revelation will come. If you carelessly handle the revelation that you get, God isn't going to give you more. And you'll lose what you had because it doesn't have meaning for you. It'll wash out. Do you understand what I'm saying? When we operate in the revelation that God has given by speaking His Word into our situation as He has instructed us, we'll enter into even more revelation to live by. 
if we disregard that revelation or take it lightly or do not act on it as God intended, we'll eventually lose even the ability to receive additional revelation. I want to go to James chapter 1 for a moment. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Uh, think about what that's saying. You can read the word, read the word, read the word, but unless you do the word, you, you're deceiving yourself thinking you have something, but if you don't do something, what you're having, it's just a, 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 a deception to think you have something you don't have. Uh -huh. You understand what I'm saying? It's kind of a circle, but he says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of a man he is. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. Yes. Blessed in what he does. Why we're applying the word, the revelation we're receiving. Do what God shows you to do. Yes. Speak what God gives you to speak so that his purpose will be carried out in your situation. The more you release the power of God's word into your life, the more you will be blessed in knowing how to release more of God's word into the situations you face. Yet it multiplies. Okay, just like we were talking about with the talents, it multiplies. The more you use it, the more it grows. The more revelation you receive and utilize in your life, uh, if you just receive revelation, say, wow, look what I got. Right. It's wonderful. You puff yourself up with saying, hey, I got a lot of revelation. Uh -huh. If you don't use it, you're cutting off the supply of getting more revelation. Yes. So the more you release the power of God's word into your life, the more you will be blessed in knowing how to release more of God's word into your situations that you face. You are multiplying the effectiveness of the revelations you receive. Did you get that? You're multiplying the effectiveness of the revelations you're receiving. You may receive revelation through words of prophecy. Okay? Prophetic insights will usually give you a confirmation to what God is already speaking to you about or dealing with you on. Or it may be a word that will be confirmed through other prophecy or through how God is working in your life. Yeah. As you know, that word is a seed that has to grow and mature and you have to protect, you, protect and nurture that word into maturity. Yeah. Okay, it's a natural seed sown in the ground. You have to watch it, water it, cut the weeds out from around it. Make sure that it has the ability to grow strong and mature into the plant that's going to bring the harvest, right? Yeah, yeah. That's how we have to receive that word. Prepare ourselves, prepare our situation, prepare our environment so that as that word matures in our life, we can move into the fullness of it. Yeah. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says this, so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed. Now that means pay attention to. Why? As a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Now that's a lot of figurative language that talks about what we're supposed to do with the prophetic word. Now the context of the verse is the prophetic word concerning the imminent return of Jesus and that we hold to as a light that shines in the dark until he appears. But the principle applies to prophetic words in general. Yeah. While we wait for the fulfillment, we may be going through a dark place, but we hold on to it with our faith yeah. because it is the light that we embrace in that dark place, that place of waiting, until the dawn of fulfillment arrives. During our waiting time, we're to be preparing ourselves for the fulfillment. Yes. There are usually 
preparations that need to be made in order to move into the provision of the Word. Yes. So we continue to thank God for the Word He's given to us and to declare that Word into our life with faith. Okay? Our praise is creating an atmosphere that is receptive for what the Word is to be birthed into. So when you receive a word, okay, don't just say around, wow, I've received a word. Wow, I've received a word. Oh, this is going to be so good. Oh, when this is fulfilled, it's going to be so good. Start thanking God for the fulfillment. See it as if it's already happened because faith is uh, seeing what isn't as though it is. Okay? Faith is now for what yet is hope. All right? That's what the Bible says. I'm just paraphrasing. So what we're doing when God gives us a word, we start declaring it as a, re, uh, a re, real truth for right now. Yes. Yes. Even though we may, may not see the fulfillment of it yet. Yes. We may not see the manifestation of it. But if he said it, that truth is going to be manifested. Yes. If we continue yes. to hold to it yes. with faith and declare it into our life and situation. Yes. Okay? So we've ha we have our responsibility. There needs... Well, let's say it this way. There is a definite process of maturing in character and integrity that needs to be accomplished in order to operate in what God is calling us into. Yes. Have you ever heard the term, the weight of responsibility? Okay. That means when you're given an amount of responsibility to accomplish something, and that responsibility has a weight that rests upon you that you have to uphold in the proper manner. Yeah. The weight of responsibility is only upheld by character and integrity that is in proportion to the responsibility. Yes. Let me say that again. Yes. Say that again. This is something that is so important for all of us to understand. The weight of responsibility is upheld by the character and integrity that is in proportion to the responsibility. The greater the responsibility you are given, the greater the character that you must develop, and the higher level of integrity that you must demonstrate. Now we know that we can only develop that level of character by learning and applying the Word of God to our lives. Okay, we accomplished that, uh, or we accomplished it by renewing our mind with the Word as, of God as we're instructed in Romans 12, right? Renew our mind with the Word. Renew it means change from the way we were thinking to the way God wants us to think. How? By looking at what His Word tells us to think, all right? and changing to line up with it. We especially learn in Galatians 5 to live in the power of the Spirit that will empower us to overcome the works of the flesh and demonstrate the character and righteousness and integrity that we need. Now the Scriptures are clear that we need to embrace the wisdom that God has made available to us okay, in His Word so we can operate at that level of character. Now, Proverbs 3, 13, it says, happier, one version says, blessed is the man who finds wisdom yes. and the man, man who gains understanding. That's an important verse to remember. Yeah. But I want to go to Proverbs chapter 2, and we're going to read 14 verses here. Proverbs chapter 2. And uh, we're going to uh, read part of it and then part of it later. But first, let's look at this. Proverbs chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. My son, if you receive my words. Yeah. See, there's a, there's a qualifier. If you receive my words and treasure my commands. There's still an if here. And if you treasure my commands within you. So that you incline your ear to what? Wisdom. And if you apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment, and if you lift up your voice for understanding, 
I'm adding some ifs here, but they're implied. If you seek her as silver, and if you search for her as hidden treasures, then, then you will understand the fear of the Lord or, or the, the reverence that you need to give and the awe that you would have for God. And you will find the knowledge of God for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Yes. Do you see this is cause and effect? Yes. Yes. Cause and effect. Seek and you will find. Search and it will be revealed. You do not gain wisdom without effort. That's right. right? Uh -huh. You do not gain wisdom without effort. Not in your spiritual life nor in your natural life. It does not just happen for you without your great desire for it and without your effort to learn. Amen. A person can gain a lot of knowledge uh -huh. but never develop the wisdom to know what to do with it. Uh -huh. it's true. I know people who have a great amount of knowledge yeah. about many things uh -huh. but have no wisdom on how to apply what they know to live with and to live with its benefits. Now, this scripture tells us that when we work at gaining the knowledge that God has supplied for us in his word, then he will impart great wisdom to know how to live accordingly so that we can apply his divine principles. Yes. And his wisdom will keep us from being deceived by evildoers or being enticed to follow wrong paths. Uh -huh. I like that. Now, let, let's go on. We're going to pick it up here again at verse 7. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. I like that. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice, preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. When wisdom enters, enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. What's discretion? Wise living, wise decisions. Understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perversity of wickedness. Do you see, God protects you when you're walking in his wisdom because you've gained knowledge from his word and wisdom to apply it. Not only do you know how to go, but God, he says, he's protecting you. The wisdom, how? The wisdom you have gained from him protects you from those things as you're making right decisions and being in the right place at the right time and not with the wrong people at the wrong time. Oh, yes. You see how the wisdom of God is our protection. Yes. It's said here, godly wisdom is our shield and our guard to preserve us from those who seek to harm us and lead us into evil. That is living in godly character and in the integrity of one who is submitted to the leading of the Spirit of God. Amen. Now, God may also reveal plans, purposes, warnings, or insights into what is to come in your dreams. Uh -huh. Some have asked, how do I know when a dream is from God? Well, first check on what you ate last night. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But usually, usually a God-given dream will have vivid details or events that will stay with you when you wake so you can meditate on the meaning. Okay, but don't take that for granted. Write it down quick. Okay? But that does not mean that every vivid dream is from God. Okay? But normally there will be a sense in your spirit that you've received something significant. Okay? When in doubt about it, Seek out someone who's seasoned in discerning things of the Spirit and ask them to help you seek out the interpretation. Now, you may receive clarity, clarity about what God has done or is doing in your life, or He may be showing you what He has in store for you so that you can make preparations 
that are needed in your life or, or situations to accept it when it appears in the natural. Sometimes you can discern a warning in the dream that will help you to be watchful for what the enemy's planning and you'll know how to strengthen your spiritual defenses to work against an attack. Yeah. So once again, I remind you that you have a responsibility to protect the revelation you have been given. Yes. Handling the revelation with godly character that you have developed will preserve the desired results that God has in store for you. Yes. When you've matured in godly character, you'll know not to speak out everything you know to everyone you meet. Yes. Let me say that again. Yes. When you have matured in godly character, you will know not to speak out everything you know to everyone you meet. Speaking out the revelations that God has intended for you to know and to develop to those who do not understand what God is doing may cause them to speak words of doubt and unbelief that will hinder, delay, or even disrupt the plan that God has implemented for you. Their words and attitudes may even cause you to endure great distress or hardship while you're waiting for its fulfillment. Uh -huh. A good example of this is found in the life of Joseph. Uh -huh. Now what's interesting is I made this message Monday before we left for the conference. I wanted to make sure we were done, had all this prepared and I could meditate on it. So the first, mess, first meeting we get into on Wednesday morning, Pastor Jeff starts in on Joseph. So, got some good confirmations here. Anyway, Joseph was a young man who was greatly loved and favored by his father. We know that. This caused great jealousy and bitterness to be displayed by his brothers. Rather than rejoice with those who receive blessing and favor from God, the church, I mean his brothers, despised him for it. Joseph was apparently seeking to know God and his ways because God began to reveal to him his plans for his future and his destiny. So he had to have a heart after God to receive, right? I mean, we know this by example and by learning. Okay? Uh, a man doesn't care, isn't going to get much message from God. All right? So there had to have been a seeking heart, something he was looking to God for, because God began to reveal his future and his destiny. Although he was seeking God, and he was developing godly character, he was still early in his maturing process, in that he still lacked wisdom. He told his brothers about the dreams God had given him, and how they would all bow down to him. Notice they did not share his excitement about that. You do not see, the, see them saying, Oh, wow, little brother is going to be a great success in life and will attain all that God has in store for him. No. But it also does not appear that his brothers were seeking to grow in relationship with God or trying to develop any spiritual understanding. They were not interested in what God wanted to do with their brother. Their only concern was what it would mean to them. They refused to see themselves in a position of honoring their brother and instead hated him the more. You can read the full account of this in Genesis 37. I'm just going to hit some highlights and, and stuff for you. But as you know, Joseph was sent by his father to check on his brothers who were out tending the family flocks. His brother's first thought, let's kill him. But instead they came up with a plan to put him in a pit and uh, come up to see if they could come up with a better solution. Well, in the meantime, a caravan of traders heading into Egypt came by, and so they sold him to this bunch of traders as a slave. Now Joseph, he said, might as well make a few bucks off little brother while we'll getting rid of him. Joseph might be wondering, maybe I shouldn't have told them about the dream. Right? 
But yet we see that Joseph had developed character to continue to have a pure heart before God in all that was happening to him. Uh -huh. right? there's, he, there's no complaining about his treatment or reviling against his brothers or even questioning God. Okay? So he, the, you can see he's developing a character and integ integrity for his life in his relationship with God. And then if we go on into Genesis chapters 39 through 47, it's a long story, it tells the whole story. Right? But we know Joseph is, is purchased by a very important man named Potiphar. He's the captain of the Pharaoh's bodyguard and chief officer over the federal prison. Now we know Joseph kept his heart right before God because we can see the effects of God's hand upon him. Let's, let's read this, Genesis 39. In Genesis 39, we're going to read the first few verses here. First six verses. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. Now, as he was walking in the anointing of God, right, because he had developed that relationship with God that was developing character and integrity. Okay? It says, And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand, or to be a success, is how that's it. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. Now this is something. Here's a slave boy. Joseph was about 17 years old when this story started. So he's maybe 18, 19 as this goes out here. Young man, not even yet 21 years old, as we would say somebody who had reached an age of accountability and, and maturity for making decisions. And he's in charge of everything the Potiphar owns. His house, his business, his farm, his estate, everything. So it was, verse 5, from the time that he, was, that he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Six, thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. So I mean you're talking about total trust in this young slave boy from another country because he recognized God's hand and anointing upon all that he did. You serve God, you're going to be blessed. That's what we say every week, right? Yes. Serve God, you're going to be blessed. This is what he was witnessing. Think about it. Would Joseph want to be there? No, no he's a young man. It's like you said, he started this account at 17. He's in a foreign country with a foreign language and a foreign culture. Yes. He's taken from the love and care of his father and placed as a slave in the house of a stranger. But it says in verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. Now the Lord was with Joseph because Joseph was with the Lord. Okay, you got to realize this. Why was the Lord with Joseph? Because Joseph was with the Lord. Rather than being bitter and resentful as he worked as a slave, he worked as unto the Lord with a spirit of wisdom and excellence, and he was blessed. Okay, the integrity and character was so evident he had charge of everything that this man owned. Because everything he did was blessed, his master and his whole household was blessed. He saw the Lord was with him, it says in verse 3. He gave more and more responsibility to Joseph and was blessed more and more for it. Now, let's go to chapter 39, verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There's no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you're his wife. How then? 
can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her, nor to be with her. He, re he maintained his integrity based upon the character he had developed in his relationship with God. Yes. Yes. Under great stress and temptation, right? Yes. However, we know that one day when there were no witnesses in the house, she tried again, and when he refused and ran away, she grabbed his car garment and kept it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it was probably like a shawl or a cape that was signified his office as manager of the estate. Yeah. Okay. Has character and integrity to avoid the problem, however, still lacking in wisdom in that he allowed himself to be in the house with this woman alone without any right. witnesses. So she made false accusation against him, used his garment as her evidence. Based upon that, Potiphar sentenced him to prison. But, listen, Potiphar did not necessarily believe his wife's story or he would have had him executed. He still had mercy on this man who had caused him to be, become very wealthy and knew his integrity and character, so he just put him in prison. You get that? Not that that's good, but it's better than the alternative. All right. Okay. So, again, we see no bitterness, no anger, no resentment, just a man dedicated to doing his best to serve the Lord in every circumstance. Now, let's go to... Uh, Verse 20, still in Genesis 39. Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were coming. This is a federal prison, okay? And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. Why? Because Joseph was still with the Lord in prison, yes. all right? And showed him mercy. And listen, he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Okay, here's this foreign slave accused by the captain of Pharaoh's guard, thrown into prison, the prison keeper, the man in charge, a federal prison, several prisoners, I'm sure, is so impressed with God's hand upon this young man, this foreigner in prison. He puts him in charge of the whole prison. Puts him in charge, not just my helper. Puts him in charge. I see the guy sitting back in his office smoking a cigar, and Joseph take care of everything. You know what I'm saying? He's not got a care in the world because Joseph is doing it. Everything in the prison. Due to his integrity and character, He's given responsibility and he prospers in all that he does. Why? His excellent character. He's in charge of running the whole prison. Now we know the story. While he's in prison. Now this is probably over a course of time. You don't rise from first man in to, to top of the, of the prison in, in a week. Okay. So he's had to be there for a while running the prison. So the people that are coming in, he's probably checking them in, right? So the, the, uh, the Pharaoh gets upset one day and sends his chief butler and his chief uh, cupbearer to prison. So while they're in there in prison, they're telling Joseph, what are you here for? And he tells them, tells them what's going on, right? And in the process of their being there, they each have a dream. They tell Joseph about it. Because right, they're important people. They have access to Joseph, the head of the prison. He's talking to them. They tell him about their dreams, and he interprets them. 
yeah, chief uh, cupbearer, three days from now, you're going to be raised up, put back into your office, and everything's going to be fine. Baker says, oh, that's a good dream. Let me tell them we're mine. Okay? The old year's not so good. Three days from now, you're going to get executed. But when they came to release the cupbearer, he says, now remember, remember me. I'm here unjustly. I'm unjustly accused. I'm in prison, you know, under wrong circumstances. Tell the authorities about it so they can get me out. They can review my case and, and have me released. He forgot. Two years goes by. Okay? Two more years, Joseph is in prison. And then Pharaoh has a dream, and the cupbearer says, Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because none of his magicians, his advisors, his wise men could interpret the dream. And he's getting upset, and he's ready to have these bad guys killed because nobody could do what they're supposed to be doing. And the cupbearer says, Wait a minute, I know a guy who interprets dreams, but he's in prison. He says, Well, get him out. I mean, that's, if, if, there's, if there's an answer, let's have it, right? So we know this, the story. He interpreted the dream, and due to his excellence in spirit, as he's told, okay, uh, Pharaoh promotes him to be the second in command over all Egypt. Well, what's happened in this time? He gives a plan to Pharaoh. So what should I do? Okay, you've interpreted my dream. What should I do about it? So he gives him the solution. Build storehouses so that during the good, good years. So when the famine comes, everybody will have to eat. And he gave him the whole plan, laid it all out. He says, where am I going to find somebody with such wisdom that can do all this? I appoint you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Hebrew slave sold by his brothers, wrongly accused, imprisoned, all of this, all of these years. Not only has he maintained character and integrity. See, he had those going in. But during the course of life under adverse circumstances, he developed some wisdom. Yes. Okay? Why? Because he was seeking God. He said God was with him. Why? Because he was with God. He's, he, he's looking to God now for the wisdom to go into whatever it is God has for him. See, I'm sure he's still holding on to that dream. God, you said one time you're going to put me in a place of authority. So, Lord, show me the wisdom on how to get there. So this is taking place, right? Long story short, famine has its effect on Egypt and all the surrounding nations. So what happens? Joseph's brothers come to Egypt for food. And it's, it's a beautiful story, what, how he tests them through this whole thing to see what is their character. Have they grown with a little integrity over all of these years, right? And he finds that they have developed some character. And so Joseph arranges to move the entire family to Egypt where they're able to live and prosper. It's, read the story. It's interesting. Yeah. It's good, good to meditate on. Yeah. Right? Now, we cut a, uh, ahead here. All of this has gone by. They've, they've lived there. They've prospered. Jacob, the father, now dies. And the brothers were in fear that now that dad's gone, Joseph's going to retaliate for all the evil we did against him, for all the lying we did about him, for all, even for lying to dad about him and saying he was dead. Okay? They figure they're in for it now. But the answer is found in Genesis chapter 50, verse 18. Genesis 50, verse 18. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face and said, Behold, we are your servants. Do you suppose they're remembering the dream as well as Joseph is yeah, at that moment? Yeah. <laughs> and Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in the for am I in the place of God? In other words, can I decide whether you live or die? Right? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Does that mean God set up bad circumstances in order to get Joseph there? There could have been other ways for him to get there to talk to Pharaoh and become... The, the chief and all of this. You understand what I'm saying? 
But because of his lack of wisdom in the beginning, even though he had character and integrity and served God, that didn't mean he was wise in all his ways. Right? And what happened? D uh, trouble and disappointment and yes. discouragement came into his life. But he maintained his integrity. He maintained his godly character. He still operated in a spirit of excellence. God rewarded that because he then developed wisdom. Wisdom. Now, there are a few lessons we want to learn from this whole account. Yes. Number one, it's sometimes better not to tell everything we know about the revelations God gives us. Yes. Sometimes we just have to live them out and people can see them when they happen. Because yes. we need to pray and meditate on it until we get a release in the spirit to either declare it or to act on it. Yes. Just because we get a revelation don't mean we run out and do it immediately either. We still have to have wisdom to know God's timing. By telling others about our prophecy or our dream or our revelation from the Word, we may be opening our life for more difficulties and hardships. Yeah. Number two, when we are going through adversity or facing difficult cir circumstances, we must keep our heart right with God. Serving God with a spirit of excellence in our hardship opens the way for his blessings and favor to work in our life. Yes. Yes. Amen. It's also a maturing process yes. where we can use what we're learning in order to develop our character and to gain the necessary wisdom we need. Uh -huh. Amen? Amen? Number three, God has a plan and a purpose for us that he will lead us into as we learn to seek him and to honor him and to serve him with a pure heart. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, as we have learned about words and the power of words, we've also now learned that we have to honor and revere the words that you give to us. They're purposeful, they're important, they're, they're powerful, and we have responsibility to treat those words with the honor that they deserve because they were your words. And to learn how to develop the character and integrity that will uphold the weight of the responsibility for caring for those words and seeing them to maturity. And Lord, you, Lord, you've shown us how to long for wisdom, to gain understanding and allow that understanding to become the wisdom we need yes. to live according to your desires, your plans, your will, your purpose, yes. and to see you glorified in all these things. So thank you, Lord, for your words of wisdom to us today. We receive them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And God bless you all who have joined us online today. And just take those words that God gives you now and rise up and develop the character and integrity that you need in your life to bring those words into maturity in the place that God has for you to fulfill his purpose. So. Go in peace and go in blessing. We'll see you again next time. Yes. And praise the Lord. Yes.